In a perfect world, we wouldn't get cancer. Why is it that we're susceptible? It turns out there are some good reasons and they're hard to get away from. The first is the evolution of aging. Maintenance gets neglected in order to support reproduction. Secondly, stem cells. We need them for repair, but they are a double-edged sword. They are pre-adapted for metastasis. Third, among mammals, we have particularly invasive placentas, and that has caused special selection for traits that later are useful in metastasizing cells. Fourth, if we look at the potential for somatic mutation, the numbers are overwhelming and they give us a real respect for how well our immune system functions in anticipating and clearing out most of the things that might turn into cancer. So first, aging. Let's rehearse that a little bit. What are the causes of aging? Aging is a byproduct of selection for reproductive performance. It's not selected in and of itself. Basically, maintenance is neglected in order to improve reproduction. And that's because things that happen early in life contribute more to reproductive success than things that happen late in life. So anything that improves performance early in life at the cost of some maintenance late in life has an advantage. Late life is discounted. The result is that aging will arise through the evolutionary accumulation of many genes that have positive effects on fitness early and either negative or neutral effects on, uh, new, negative effects on fitness late in life. So their benefits outweigh their costs. Now, when we look at what happened since the demographic transition, that is when mortality rates and birth rates fell, we, we re reduced mortality. We did it with vaccines, we did it with hygiene, we did it with clean water. And basically that then made cardiovascular disease the major killer. Then we learned through lifestyle changes and statins and lots of other things how to better treat and prevent cardiovascular disease. And now cancer has emerged as a major killer. And so is Alzheimer's. So that kind of cycle just keeps going on. Now if we go back and ask where did another origin of our susceptibility come from, it actually originated when we became multicellular. That's deep time. That's one and a half billion years ago. The deal then was struck that somatic cells would stop reproducing. In this picture of Volvox, the somatic cells are the little guys and the reproductive cells are the bright green blobs. The germ cells would propagate the genes. So by achieving this division of labor, the entire group got an advantage of efficiency and produced more copies of the genes in the next generation. But the deal was that somatic cells didn't get to get into the next generation. In order to keep that whole organism functioning, stem cells arose to repair tissue. Cancer breaks that covenant. In cancer, the somatic cells go out of control and they no longer support the group effort. It turns out that most cancers originate in stem cells. They're a great innovation. Some of their characteristics may have been selected by cancer. What I mean by that is that there's a certain amount of mortality which is caused by cancer. That's a selective force that may have fed back to shape stem cells a bit so that they uh, remained well behaved. They divide slowly. They retain the potential to differentiate. So a stem cell which formed in an embryo and has been sitting in your skin for 20 or 30 years still has the ability to turn into a skin cell. A stem cell sitting in a crypt in your colon can turn into a colon cell. So they are sitting all around our body next to tissue which is undergoing renewal and needs repair and they are the agents of repair. Now their slow division would reduce cancer frequency but their potential to differentiate 
pre-adapts them to becoming cancers. They're positioned all over the body, and in particular in places that need lots of renewal and repair like bone marrow, lungs, intestine, and skin. And when you read through that short list, I hope you see that that's actually where a lot of our cancers originate. They originate in tissues that are dividing and where cells need to be replaced. Now, how does the body keep somatic cells under control? It's an issue that is more general than cancer. After all, we don't want brain cells developing in our liver, and we don't want skin cells developing in our muscles. Well, early in development, the germline is physically isolated, and that keeps somatic cells from invading the germline. You might want to think of the somatic cells saying to themselves, oh, that covenant we struck one and a half billion years ago, that was a bad deal. I'm not getting into the next generation. I don't want to die. I want to go into a gonad. Well, that probably is a process that has acted over evolutionary time, and early in development, the germline becomes physically isolated in, certainly, in our lineage. Then, tumor suppressor genes are controlling differentiation, and they deal with damage. So, if a cell starts to proliferate when it should not, it gets a signal that it should kill itself, apoptosis. And all cells are set up to receive such signals and act on them. So the machinery is in place for our own cells to tell other of our own cells to die. That, by the way, is how our hand was formed. All the cells between our fingers were told to kill themselves, and they did. Secondly, if DNA in a cell is damaged, an attempt will be made to repair it, but if the damage can't be repaired, then the cell gets a signal to kill itself because our immune system, uh, you can think of it as thinking to itself, uh-oh, that cell has got some kind of defect and it might go out of control. We can't fix it, so we'd better get rid of it. Now, what that means is that one of the most crucial mutations on the way to cancer is the mutation that disables the receptor for apoptosis, the receptor whereby the cell receives and acknowledges the signal that it should kill itself. Cancer cells ignore that signal. They say, no deal, we're just going to keep going. Here is a picture of a T cell, which is in orange, bound to an apoptosing cell. So you can see that the T cells in the immune system are actually the carriers of this signal. Now, where do the mutations come from that cause cancer? Well, first, some of them are just bad luck, okay? So during mitosis, during the duplication of the genome, a mistake gets made. Our genome has about three billion nucleotides, and no copying process is perfect. Moreover, there are good reasons why the copying process should not be perfect. We can only continue to adapt and evolve if we have some mutations. Secondly, we are exposed to mutagens, things that cause mutations. Ultraviolet light and cigarette smoke are both things that are mutagenic. Of course, so are radioactive substances. Third, chronic wounding and inflammation will cause mutations. In the process of uh, inflammation, the biochemical reactions that are going on in the tissue are releasing free radicals. They're releasing basically protons, hydrogen nuclei. Those form, uh, those react with water to form very reactive substances that can go in and damage the DNA. So chronic wounding and inflammation is mutagenic. And in most cases, chronic exposures are much worse than acute exposures. So being out and getting sunburned every day for 20 years is really bad, but one bad sunburn probably won't do you in. Now, what about genes for cancer? It is probably a mistake, a malapropism, to think of genes that way because cancer is maladaptive, and evolution never selected genes for cancer. All the genes that are involved in cancer proliferation 
are actually there to do something else. Many of them in early embryogenesis, they mediate cell migration, cell adhesion, clonal proliferation. The carcinogenic mutations are disturbing the controls on these genes and they release normal functions at inappropriate times and places. Those are examples of antagonistic pleiotropy, positive effects early in life, negative effects late in life. Early in life, these genes are involved in building a healthy, normal embryo. And if natural selection were to protect us from cancer by eliminating these genes, we wouldn't be able to develop. So this is a fundamental trade-off. If we inherit a disposition to cancer, then it is often in a gene that is performing one of these normal beneficial functions. Now, how many mutations does it take? It's not just one. Cancer requires a series of mutations to accumulate. If some of them are already in the germline, then that just means that there are fewer that have to accumulate later in the soma. It takes about seven to nine mutations, and they are of a particular sort, that will allow a cell to escape control over its cell cycle and then eventually to become mobile. Normally, the immune system keeps these from spreading, okay? But if one of the mutations is to ignore the signal to commit suicide, then all of the descendants of that cell are going to be able to ignore it, and they can grow, reproduce, and spread. Cancer is also, in an important way, a numbers game, and there are some very big numbers involved. So how many somatic mutations can accumulate in the development of an organism. We expand from a single-celled zygote to about 10 to the 13th or 10 to the 14th cells. That requires about the same number of cell divisions, and every cell division is an opportunity for mutation. The somatic mutation rate per gene per cell division is about 10 to the minus 7th to 10 to the minus 6th. So you just take those numbers and you multiply them by those numbers and you come to the conclusion that the number of somatic mutations per gene per individual is about 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 8th. That's between 100,000 and 10 million to 100 million uh, mutations per gene in our bodies. Every gene in the genome mutates many, many times in the soma of every individual. Now, fortunately, not every cell type produces cancer, and not every gene is involved in cancer production. So this is the total number of mutations, but there are many genes. There are about, oh, say, 20, 30,000 genes in the human genome. That means not all somatic mutations are equally dangerous, thank heavens. About 350, or about 1% of our genes, are somehow involved in producing cancer. It's usually mutations in stem cells, not in differentiated tissue, that produce cancer. So most of the tissue that has stopped dividing is not a threat anymore. However, mutations that occur quite early in development, even in the fetus, are really quite important because they can produce a lineage of cells that have some mutations within which other mutations can accumulate. That means each cell lineage in the body develops a unique history. And if we look at that assemblage of histories, we see that there are more than 10 to the 16th cells per individual per lifetime, and the lineage history within a single human being is greater than that of all humans who have ever lived. So actually, if we look at each of our cell lineages as an individual, we each of us contain more history than all humankind. Now, why is it that some tissues are more susceptible than others? Well, epithelia 
are more exposed. So in the lung and lungs and the skin, environmental carcinogens can directly hit the cells. Cancer is more likely in tissues that are mitotically active. So leukemias and lymphomas form, not cancers of red blood cells, which don't undergo mitosis. We have endometrial cancers, but we don't have cancers in the fallopian tubes, which are not cells undergoing mitosis. And there are cancers of secretory tissues, which are quite active and where cells are dividing in the gut, breast, cervix, prostate, but not in smooth muscle or in the lining of the reproductive system. Children are more susceptible to brain and bone cancers than adults precisely because they are growing rapidly and producing many cell divisions. So that's one of the explanations for cancer occurring in very young people. When cancers appear in tissues that are not undergoing mitosis, they're very likely to be secondary sites that are metastases spreading from other cancers. So a cancer might form in a breast or in the pancreas or in the colon, but then spread into tissue that's not dividing. So to summarize, we age as a byproduct of selection for reproductive performance. And that means that maintenance has been neglected for good reason. We need stem cells to maintain our tissues, but mutations in stem cells actually add two things that predispose them to being metastatic. We need some modest mutation to maintain evolution. Over the long course of evolutionary history, the mutation rate has been adjusted by selection it's been adjusted to a low level, but not to zero, because there needs to be some level of genetic variation trickling into populations to keep them adapted. We need cell functions early in development that would be cancerous if they were not controlled. So things that happen in the developing bodies of fetuses and infants, which are good in terms of tissue and cell behavior, are malignant when expressed later at inappropriate times and places. Humans are especially vulnerable to cancer because of their long post-reproductive period, their exposure to novel risk factors, mutagens in the environment, and their unusual sexuality, which means they have tissues that keep dividing in their bodies that don't divide in the bodies of many other organisms nearly as frequently. So the bottom line, we are trading vulnerability to cancer for valuable benefits. What do we trade it for? We trade it for reproduction, tissue maintenance, evolvability, development, and sexuality, all very important aspects of our life.